This is Christopher Carter, composer for Young Justice, and you are listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Jamie Catania, D-5-4. Initiate, part three. So, so, so yeah, so Great Darkness, that, that, that sci-fi framework, um, and it also introduces that era with Levitt at, at the helm, introduces some uh, really uh, popular legionnaires. So we get the second Invisible Kid, Jacques Focard. Yep. He uh, is a childhood friend of Lyle Norg. The old Invisible Kid manages to uh, inject himself with the invisibility serum in a you know moment of crisis and gets those powers and has been with the Legion for a while now. Dream Girl, uh, Nero Nal's sister Misa Nal, the White Witch. She's a magic user. She's really, really critical to the Great Darkness saga, and I, I'm very excited to talk about the ways in which magic plays into the relationship between right. Great Darkness and Young Justice right. uh, with all the Doctor Fate and everything. Um, but one interesting thing about White Witch that I just really quick is that her magic is very specifically written as taking a lot of preparation. So she uh, keeps a handful of spells on hand that she can use for a given situation. But and it's it's kind of non-specific. But it's like oh you know checking the phases of the moon, checking the charts ahead of time. You know, very ritualized. Very ritualized, and so. It, it prevents her from being a catch-all in a way that a lot of magical characters can sometimes be, right. while still being a very vital player. We also get Quizlet, uh, who's uh, one of the first uh, non-humanoid members, who's uh, kind of an energy form like Wildfire, and he can possess objects. Telus, one of my all-time favorite Legionnaires, who's a big fish guy with telepathy and telekinesis. Sensor Girl, Pr- Princess Projectra, comes back after having been gone for a long time, and there's a whole arc, who is Sensor Girl? Mystery of it. Right. Yeah, it's her... Um, and so that's all Levitz in that era. The next thing we hit is Crisis on Infinite Earths. Crisis on Infinite Earths happens, and the Earth-1 version of Superboy who inspired the Legion is wiped from the timeline. He was never Superboy, he was always Superman, and that came about later in life. One of the major retcons of Crisis. And so, in order to preserve the timeline of the Legion, DC Editorial came up with this notion of the pocket universe Superboy. And so, basically, what that involved was uh, one of the Legion's main villains, a purple robe-wearing guy called the Time Trapper. He created a pocket version of Earth-1 in order to preserve the modern uh, 30th century continuity, where Superboy still existed. He was kind of the only superhero. It was was a very um, uh, Silver Age kind of preserved bubble, and he would direct the Legion's time travel to that pocket universe. So every time they'd been interacting with Superboy and thinking it was the kid version of Superman, it was this this uh, pocket dimension, this time remnant right. ex- created by uh, Time Trapper. And so this deception is is eventually revealed in in some complicated ways. Um, but essentially, the Legion ends up in post crisis present day, and Superman has no idea who they are. And it's this horrible, shocking moment of of just. You know, right. What do you mean? This is one of our best friends. What do you mean? Like, right. And he's grown into an adult and he has no memory of the years and years and years we've spent together and all of this right. you know, nonsense. And eventually they team up with the pocket universe Superboy to defeat the Time Trapper and he sacrificed his life and the, the, the pocket, um, pocket universe, uh, or he sacrifices his life to save the pocket universe and is gone from Legion continuity from that point on. Small fun fact. Don't even remotely want to dive into this nonsense. But if you're at all familiar with the shape-shifting alien Matrix version of Supergirl, right. she is also from that pocket. That universe. was some serious nonsense. Serious right? nonsense. <laughs> um, so that all wraps up. Um, Levitz's run on Legion ends with uh, the conclusion of his four-part Magic Wars storyline, which kind of deals with uh, a resurgence of magic in the galaxy and technology starts to get disrupted and the old ways are kind of returning and, and all of the technology that the UP depends on to function is breaking down. It's an interesting story. It's, you know, worth checking out and, and that's kind of his uh, magnum opus on, on the end of the end of that Legion run. And then we get five years later. So the artist who had been working with Paul Levitz, Keith Giffen, jumps in and he takes over writing duties for the Legion. Right. He decides he's just going to blow everything up. He blows like, it all up. Like we said, it's 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 deconstruction and reconstruction. Right. And so he breaks it all down and says, we're skipping five years into the future. So 
every every Legion as DC publishes um, books so that we're always in the present. Legion is published so that it's always a thousand years from the day it's published, and so now we're a thousand five years in the future. Right. And in this timeline, everything has collapsed. The Legion has collapsed. The Dominators who are those big alien guys with the discs on their head that are not very nice and they have big teeth. They are controlling a puppet government of the Earth. Um, you know, everybody's scattered to the winds. Everything's corrupt. People are dead. You know, Cosmic Boy lost his powers in this war with Shrinking Violet's planet. It's a mess. A lot of fans were not happy. Some were. It's controversial. There's a really good essay about it in that essay. Not written for me, that no, one. not written yeah. for me either. And that's why I don't want to kind of dive too far into it because yeah. I think it is well written for what it is. I yeah. think it is a very clever take that I do not personally Right, right. That's not, it was not the reason, the, the, the things they were highlighting were not the reason that drew me to the exactly. Legion. That does not make it a bad story. No, and, and in many ways it is actually very innovative and very interesting. It's just not right. my cup of tea. Um, but shortly after the, that relaunch, and I mean very shortly after, DC did a 180 and decided that the Legion actually cannot ever mention Superboy. No pocket universe, no nothing. Like, it's just, it's too complicated, we can't do it. Okay, all right, well, glad we spent time on that, glad we published that whole Pocket Universe saga. And so the way that they decided to fix it was that they were going to insert the Legionnaire mon from who we, who we touched on earlier, who basically has Superboy's powers. It's from a planet called Daxum, which is very similar to Krypton, and in some continuities is actually a, a, a colony. colony. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to insert him back into the continuity. And so um, basically it is revealed that mon killed the Time Trap, and an essence of the Time Trapper still is alive in mon subconscious. And basically, they're able to go into mon subconscious, kill the Time Trapper, cause the pocket universe to be erased from all time, as though it never existed, because once it's destroyed, it's, it's destroyed from every moment in time. And that means that the Legion was never formed, um, because they were never inspired by Superboy. And in this timeline... Everything is ruled in the future by Mordru, the Lord of Chaos that we mentioned before. So he's like Clarion in the level right. of his power, but he's kind of the leader of the, the Lords of Chaos. And we never see any of the other Lords of Chaos in the 30th century, so it's a little bit implied that he may be the last one. Whatever. Or, or yeah. taking their right. power, or what, you know, whatever it is. And he's married to a former henchwoman of the old uh, Time Trapper called Glorith. She learns of the existence of the previous timeline and teaming up with some of the other Legionnaires uses magic to restore a rough version of the previous timeline, but with herself in all of the historical places where the Time Trapper was in the original continuity. mon is inserted in all of the places where Superboy was in the original continuity. So just real quick, as a comp- just because it's got to be said, the reason why mon is named mon mm-hmm. is because Superboy found him kind of thought he was a relative of some form or a, a survivor of Krypton. I believe even explicitly was like, this is my brother. I'm deciding this now. Right. So where Superboy's Kryptonian name is Kal-El, he gave him the last name of L and found him on a Monday. Yep. Yep. mon L. mon L. There you go. So <laughs> Just wanted to insert that nonsense. And it's also appropriate because, so now we can, the, the character's name is Largand. That is right. his real name. And so at this point, we're actually, he's not mon L. So okay. um, we're jumping back to that timeline around when he encountered Superboy, although now that hasn't happened because right. Superboy doesn't exist. And so instead, uh, Largand is a hero called Valyor. Valyor. Uh, right. And I actually don't know how that is pronounced. I pronounced it Valyor, but it is... I think it's Valor. Valor like the word. I think, but That's it's another one of those weird. weird yeah. things with I comics gotcha. fans where we all have it's a different way to pronounce right. What's how you can have twin super speedsters named Dawn and Dawn, yeah. and some parent thought that was a good idea? <laughs> well, because sometimes it's written like a Kryptonian name, V-A-L dash right. O-R, O-R, and sometimes it's just the word Valor. Right. Um, but so, so basically, he's a hero in the 20th century, and he is the new inspiration of the Legion, and then he is frozen in the, the buffer zone, the Phantom Zone, again, the same way, and then is awoken years later. And so in the Centuries. new... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the new Glorith verse, they call it timeline. Monel, Valor, whatever Valor, uh, saved the Earth from an invasion by the Dominators, that group that is controlling Earth right. of, and they were doing a lot of the same stuff that we see Apocalypse at the Reach and all of them in the Unjust continuity doing with metahumans, doing a lot of experiments, and it's explicitly um, 
reference that the reason why Earth was a target for this invasion is because of the weaponized potential of the metagene. Nice. Yeah, and if you, if any of you, again, are fans of the CW Arrowverse, um, one of their crossover episodes, the third crossover, is called Invasion, and it's an adaptation of this storyline where the Dominators invade Earth. They try to detonate a metagene bomb that's going to destroy all of the metagenes on Earth. And, you know, it's a very rough adaptation, but right. it's the same idea. Valuor defeats the Dominators, and he ends up with these massive pods of kids and and some adults that have been given meta powers right and he decides to take them to various planets in between dominion territory and and where earth is in space and seed them with these metas and create buffer planets that are designed to have meta powered human societies develop on these planets to serve as a military buffer between the dominion and earth so that they're not going to, you know. Fascinating. And wow. those planets are treated as the origin of most of the United Planets membership that we see later on as a sort of backdoor retcon for why do all of these aliens look, look like, like humans Humans yeah. with one single superpower? Right, and So you right. get the Brawlians are all of the, the people. It's, I don't think they go into a ton of detail about like, oh, yeah, all right, the magnetic group, stand over here. You're going to one planet. And the, right. the duplicating group, stand over here. Right. You're going to one planet. Right. <laughs> um, but that's essentially what, what they do with that. So jump back to the future. Five years later, Valior is now the Superboy stand-in. They're still adults. All of this is happening. And Supergirl has been replaced by this character, Laurel Gand, who is a uh, descendant of mon from Daxum, but, you know, is, you know, she's got the skirt, she's got the blonde hair. She's basically, she's, yeah. yeah. And she just is treated as having been everywhere that the Legion was in history. Now, the next thing that we get in Giffen's five-year later run is this storyline featuring a group called Batch SW6. Is oh, that familiar that's a, to yeah, you? Yeah, that's a whole thing, too. Batch SW6, very complicated. Don't even really want to dive into all of it. Basically, child clones of the Legion, it seems. Turns yeah. out that they're actually time duplicates, but the way that in which they're relevant to the continuity the most is that it was their first attempt at a soft one. It right. was giving the, the, uh, taking Legionnaires from, from the, the Silver Age, like, you know, back when everyone knew them most. It was, I think they said it was at the height of their power. So it was like right, right, right after or right before Pharaoh Lad's death. And they gave them new costumes. A bunch of them got new code names, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yep, yep. And it was testing the waters for a reboot of the Legion. Yeah. And so then we get to Zero Hour. And Zero Hour was DC's attempt to do for its many future and past timelines what they did for their alternate universes with Crisis and Streamline it. And this is the uh, the Mark Wade reboot because uh, they did this reboot things that they weren't really speaking to me, mm -hmm. but I did like the Zero Hour one. There was something that just called back to the the fun aspects yeah. of the Legion that I liked. So the the what they give and take in all of the different reboots is very interesting, and in the way that it speaks to the different uh, things that are critical to the to the foundations of the Legion. So what you get with the new reboot Legion after Zero Hour is a group. We we go back to the basics. We get the three founders. We get them saving R.J. Brand. We right. get all of that, and then from there it diverges a little bit. Now. Rather than it being a club that kids are coming to sign up for, they're a UP sanctioned task force and planets are mandated to draft To draft citizens. someone. Yep. Every planet must present a citizen under 18, apparently, drafted into this paramilitary organization. <laughs> right. um, in the first mission, Leviathan, which is the new name for Colossal, Colossal Boy, Boy, he was designated as leader because of his science police training. Because um, he was basically a cop. Yeah. And uh, a newer character called. Um, Kid Quantum is killed in action because of Leviathan's uh, choices. choices. And right. so that was a way of sort of saying, we're going to stick Cosmic Boy back in charge now, but show that he was leader for a reason. That it yeah. didn't just like, you know, it was just handed in because he was first, right? And it's like, I don't personally know that that needed to have been explained, but it's again, revisiting why these things are the way they are. Right, right. Um, and so we get... You know, we get changes in their code names. Triplicate Girl becomes Triad. Phantom Girl becomes Apparition. Lightning Red right. is Live Wire. It's kind of trying to be, it's, it's, it's right. a much, much the Christian Bale Batman trying to be like, let's make it more realistic because, right, right. you know, while we're in space fighting aliens, the thing we need is more realism. It and less, less alliteration in our names. Right. <laughs> um, and so all of these, the, these members are kind of drafted in and this reboot legion deals a lot more with politics yes we get a lot of politics daxum the home planet of mon is uh recast as extraordinarily xenophobic
claustrophobic. Yep. And that is the explanation for why we don't have a ton of supermen running around the galaxy. They don't even want to touch other human beings. Right. Or other other, uh, other beings. creatures. Yep. And so uh, Andromeda, who's kind of a soft reboot of that Laurel Gand character, she has the same name. Um, she is drafted into the Legion, and she wears what is called a trans suit. It's like a Ziploc bag over your body that is invisible and, like, you know protects her from lead essentially and right. she's a horrific bigot and is yeah you know does, uh, they're against her will looks down on everyone else and it takes her trans suit being punctured and getting lead poisoning and bringing five saving her life to kind of confront that bigotry and to you know make her realize that she was raised exclusively on propaganda she had never met an alien before she right. joined the legion and like it's a little ham-fisted in the way that, like, I think we're all a little sick of, like, look at the way this marginalized person just proved their worth. Now I don't have to treat them like garbage. But right. the way that these planets are so separate, I mean, it was also a good look at the way that propaganda can shape a society and shape a person's perceptions. That's an interesting echo or interesting, like, callback to the Legion as well, because Laurel Gand is obviously some kind of parallel to Supergirl. Yep. And in the classic Legion storyline, and you see this in the Justice League Unlimited episode where Supergirl goes to the future, Supergirl and Brainiac 5 have a thing yes. uh, over, well, he's got a thing for her and she doesn't and blah, blah, blah. And it goes back and forth in the comics, but you see that in Justice League Unlimited and that's it's an interesting kind of, that Brainiac 5 happened to be that choice. It so is. And I, I see, think I that see might have th- been the beginning of, of, of some sort of feelings between Right. And, and I see that. I see that. And I'm like, okay, somebody's making some kind of callbacks, some kind of echoes to those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and then because we're in another reboot continuity, got to talk about Monel. Monel's still back in, in the 20th century. He's being Valor. Valor ends up in the Phantom Zone, comes to the future. And in this timeline, again, he's their inspiration. Uh, he's the Superman figure. And so it's they, still so strange to me, but it keeps being uh, used. I, it's, yeah. Well, and so what they decide to do is lean into that. They decide to say that not only was the Legion inspired by him, but he is a massively inspirational figure. His seeding of the buffer planets made him the founding father of the United Planets. He wow. is Yeah, lean into essentially, it. Essentially, yep. yep. you know, he, he is he is beyond like their Benjamin Franklin. He's their Jesus <laughs> right. Christ. Like <laughs> right. he, you know. And so when he shows up, they are terrified of this religious fervor that is going to come about by the second coming of Valor. And so he does not reveal his identity. He assumes a new name given to him by R.J. Brand, which is Monel, but written M apostrophe capital O N E L, like a Martian name, uh, and is Martian for one who wanders. Yeah, and that is because this version of R.J. Brand is John Jones. What? To the best of my what? knowledge, yes. To the best of my knowledge, that was never fully explored in in the in the reboot continuity. But yes, that was the. I know, I know. I'm seeing your face, and I, I was hoping we'd be able to get uh, to that. My head blew. You, yep, that's yep. it. This is the moment in which my mind was blown. You got real close several times. That, all right, keep moving. And it's, and it's, <laughs> it's. I don't know what went into that, but it's like you already had him as a Durlin. We already had this shape shifting, shape shifting R.J. Brand like, thing. Well, why not just you know, if he's a shapeshifter who shapeshifts in the DC universe and is probably going to live for a thousand years. Oh, John Jones. <laughs> What? Mm-hmm. Okay, that, I have questions, but well, let's move on because I do want to see. I do definitely want to see because there's. I know there's a couple more reboots and some new things, right? Let's. I do want to pull into Young Justice too. The the one last thing to touch on in the this era of the reboot is yeah. Rachel Gould because this is the one where he comes <laughs> That's up. Another one that you blew my mind. It's okay. So, um, there's a character from the earlier Legion continuity called Leland McCauley. He's just, he doesn't really matter. He's R.J. Yeah. Brand's uh, business yeah, rival. Yeah, and yeah. He often hires terrorists and, you know, right. general I remember and Leland. the Legion. In, ooh, but, in, but, but the Legion. <laughs> um, in this continuity, R.J. Brand has become president of the United Planets and through a complicated series of events is ousted. He's, been, he's blamed for a bunch of things that are not his fault and okay. is removed from office. Yeah. And Leland McCauley takes over. And the, the Legion sort of is not able to prevent this from happening. It's during an era where the first Legion Lost series has been launched. Half of the Legion is believed dead. They're on the other side of the galaxy. Yeah, I remember that. It's yeah. very compelling stuff. I wish we had more time to dive into it. But essentially, they make it back and the UP is a mess. Uh, McCauley's a reactionary. He's a xenophobe. He has dismantled 
the Stargate system, which allows interplanetary commerce to function by saying that this is the way that um, disease is spread. That was one of the main things that led to R.J. Brown's ouster is that he, in this timeline, was the inventor of the Stargates. Yes. And was saying, you know, well, you spread this blight. That's a pretty display. common thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so basically the Legion finds Macaulay's body and they're like, oh, someone else is making these decisions and is driving the Earth towards um, pulling out of the United Planets and, and trying to push this xenophobic um, kind of ideal. And basically, uh, eventually it's discovered that Ra's al Ghul, who has been assumed dead for thousands of years, or for hundreds of years, is has assumed Macaulay's identity and is acting as president of the United Planets. And his goal here is to, bear with me, move the moon closer to the Earth, accelerating the evolution of humanity through a process he calls hypertaxis, which will cause yeah. most of the population to, to die, die and the rest of their metagenes to not just kick in, but go into overdrive, transforming them into a new species that will be able to effectively compete with the powered aliens that have come to dominate the culture and economy of the galaxy. Okay. To replace Earth for you Young Justice fans, as the center of galactic prominence and power. It's very similar to the goals of the light and very similar to the sort of uh, League of Shadows uh, version of race that we see. Right. Even even that we see in um, the, the, the Nolan trilogy, where right. it's played by Liam Neeson, and the idea is that they kind of burn down cities when they get too um Yes, uh, where they're, uh, yeah, causing this thing that, that, that Vandal is talking about, that the Legion basically is causing humanity to be to stagnate because exactly. it is causing a lack of strife and conflict. Exactly. And uh -huh. so the Legion uh, ultimately defeats Raish and the Legionnaire known as Kinetics, who is a new Legionnaire in this timeline. She's a magic user and a telekinetic. She is one of the few humans that's affected by the early onset of hypertaxis, and she organizes the other humans that have been changed. They're called terror forms now, like terraforming a planet, but right. terror. Uh-uh. Uh, uns, uh, uh. DC. <laughs> Um, and they use their newfound elemental powers to force the moon back into orbit. So it's the the, the very uh, thing that Raish initiated gives them the power to stop him. And it's just, I don't know where they're going with this, but when it, as soon as they, you know, Raish is not part of the light anymore, he's doing his own thing, and I'm just concerned. Rich. Oh, wow. We'll see where we're going. Yeah. So is this a, is, I, I've already dropped a few hints about some of the things about this thing you were talking about earlier about the clone Superboy mm -hmm. now being the inspiration. My thing about like, again, I'm not sure about the exact dates, whether it's the exact date that Superboy becomes public. We mm -hmm. see Saturn Girl, and I'm still saying it's Saturn Girl, mm -hmm. serving him coffee, or if it was the next day, or if it, but it's in this scene basically right afterwards, yep. right? It's narratively connected. We see this member of the Legion is back in time, uh, doing a thing with su right near Superboy. Yeah, right. So when we were talking about having this conversation, not only did I want to talk about this because this this history is so long and so complex in DC, and and we're still not even done with reboots necessarily. We're um, nowhere near. Yeah. So, but we're going to try and move past some of that and get into this Young Justice stuff. Just this is giving you a taste of what yes. we're starting with, and this is history that oh, so few. DC Comics fans know anything about. It's so self-contained. It's its own, own right. world. Right. Very rarely like, does it cross over into the main continuities of comics. Like the fact that we even got a Justice League in the Fatal Five yep. the animated series it was, was a like... weird choice. I was very surprised I, I was that. too, and I actually really enjoyed it oh, because so we good. also get to introduce New Lantern, mm -hmm. right? And the whole deal, and that's just fantastic. Yeah. But this thing about Young Justice, why? What do you think is happening here? You were like, I have got tin hats for days. I want to hear tin hats for days. All Let's right, get so, into this. So my tin hat is sitting uh, with the Great Darkness Saga right now. Yeah. There's a lot of tin hats, um, especially maybe we'll get a little bit of a chance to dive into the three boot, which is the one that comes after this reboot. Right. There's a tin hat there, but my big tin hat is with the anti-life equation. Okay. So tell me. The Great Darkness Saga was published in a time when the mythos surrounding the fourth world from my understanding as someone who is not a big reader of the fourth world, was much vaguer than it will get. Yeah. We hadn't gotten generations upon generations of fourth world stories. It was very mystical and nonspecific and mythical. Yeah. So 
Darkseid yeah, yeah. is a big time magic user, for instance, in the Great Darkness Saga. It starts because his servants are collecting magic artifacts from planets all over the galaxy to power him up. They steal Excalibur from the Museum of Magic in London. They steal right, that you know, Supergirl had found. Yeah. During right. her Legion audition in the Silver Age. Right. And so that got me thinking, you know, Legion or uh sorry, Young Justice, we get a lot of magic. I mean, this has been the, the relationship between magic and science has been seeded from denial. Yes. We have been talking about and having that conversation since then. And I've just been thinking about that, especially um, kind of paralleled with the MCU, if people are viewers of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and how they decided to approach that with a one-off line in the first Thor movie saying, what you view as uh, yeah. magic, we view as science because, you know, We're aliens. so advanced, right? Yeah. And they never really gave it much more thought. And that has been retconned a little bit and like, you know, Doctor Strange and they're diving into it more now. But right. they really largely decided to not in favor of big explosions for a long time. Young Justice has these two diametrically opposed ideas and are constantly showing us the ways that they're more similar than we expect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're constantly being challenged to ask is there a science to this magic that we're seeing? Is there magic to the science that we're seeing? Is a mother box magic? It is a piece of technology. It is a computer. Yeah. But like, what is happening here? There is some magical elements to this that we can't explain. So one of Darkseid's really big moments in the Great Darkness Saga is that he encounters mon and through some sort of telepathy discovers the existence of the planet Daxon, which he didn't know about for the entirety of the, his, his present-day continuity, right. according to this story. And he travels to the planet Daxon and enslaves the entirety of the Daxamite race to his will. Yes. In a way that is very nonspecific in the pages of the book, and is very just like, I'm a god. I exerted my will over these people. Oh! And the <laughs> minute that I looked at that page, I was immediately taken to that moment on Granny Goodness' station of all of the, the League standing there, ready to do the bidding of Darkseid. And... They have, he has the Daxamites fly out from their planet in this amazing panel drawn by, I can't believe I don't know the artist on, on Darkness, but a, an amazing panel. Um, they're all flying in unison, and they, as a collective three billion strong force, reshape the surface of their planet into an effigy of Darkseid in perfect synchronicity at the direction of his will. And I'm like, well, that's the anti-life equation. That's there you go. That's there what's you go. happening here. And, and just to just to make it clear, the the Great Darkness Saga. I, I'm currently rereading it now, and I haven't read it, and I don't even want to came out 25, mm-hmm. 30 years ago, or something. So uh, it's available on DC Universe, so you can actually go and download those and, yeah. and read what we're talking about here. I hear you, and that has come up multiple times with people online too about this idea of the Great Darkness Saga being part of it, not not only because it has dark side in it. I didn't. I haven't. I haven't gotten in my reread to this part because I don't remember that much. I had. It came out in the nineties. Darkness. No. No. Eighties. No, or eighties. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Was or it eighties? Eighty two. I want to say it was one of Giffen's first things during his continue. Or uh, sorry, Levitz's first stories during his. Continuous oh, that's run. right. That's right. Now I'm thinking about all the artwork that was in there. Oh, and the second Invisible Kid was in there. Yeah, it's actually. Yeah, the, it would have been the eighties. The second Invisible Kid has a really distinctive sh- uh, white streak in his dark hair, and that comes from looking upon the face of Darkseid. And right. He's so you know, right? Just like because Darkseid basically says him like, "I will give you the thing you are looking for to look upon my visage yes. and carry this with you or whatever." Yeah, so I'm, when I read it, I was 13 or 14, and I don't own them. I think it was a friend of mine who had bought those at comics. And my brother was already, had already left home. He was right, in the Air Force. Right. He wasn't picking up that comics anymore. So I only had so much money to be able to buy comics. I remember reading it. So I'm rereading it, and I'm like going, oh, man. I do remember like Matter Eater Lad is... Um, ha- is He's gone insane. Mm-hmm. For meeting the Miracle Machine. Right, which was a whole thing that I actually, I'm sure I have the issue in here where he ate it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to try and save the universe by consuming this all-powerful device. And uh, so that was going on. I was just like, man, wow, like the flashbacks to this thing. So so tell me more. That's a huge tin hat. Tell me some more. Another one is that uh, just more, more kind of tie-ins to like, what does it mean to potentially tell the Great Darkness Saga from a perspective of having more canon on the dark side, fourth world end of things than we had when the story was told. Oh, and, yeah. And having the, the, the um, 
anti-life equation particularly introduced in such a solid like what i've loved so much about the the handling of the fourth world in this third season is that the anti-life equation in every other context is such an infuriating MacGuffin. it, it is. is never used in yep. any interesting ways because it's just you know dark side can't get it and if he gets it it'll be the end of the world like that yeah yeah and he gets it i mean granny at least gets it right and and we have the moment of really actually seeing its power used and that is they never go there and it and, and yeah. it's and I'm, I'm sure maybe they have i'm uh, they're probably i don't remember stories, anything every time but, we've talked about it and i i, I mean as, as always if we're not say if we, if we say something that you guys know more information mm-hmm. about than we do please do there's no possible way you can know everything <laughs> about everything despite but how hard i we don't try. know this is the first time i've seen anything that there was some definition of what does the anti-life equation even mean so one of the big, uh, basically how the darkness begins is that these, these magical artifacts are being stolen from throughout the galaxy by unknown dark entities. Right. And they're, they're kind of shadowy beings. They're, they're familiar. They look familiar. Familiar shapes and shadows yeah, and things like that. You know, one with a big pink triangle on its chest. There's one with a big head, uh, you know, kind of things like that. And over time, that becomes one of the big clues for, um, you know, what we're dealing with here is we discover that the the big one with the cape and the triangle is a quote unquote reverse DNA clone, which yes. let's not even touch that right, right. of Superman. The one with the big head and the psychic powers is one of the Owens, the guardians of the universe, the right. masters of the Green Lantern Corps. Right. One of them is an ancestor of Shadow Lass. Yes, Lydia Maller, who was at the time of the publication of this book, uh serving as a member of the Legion uh L period. E the L E G I O N, right? Yeah. Which was a whole we won't get into that. Anyway. But it's, but yeah. yeah. It's they're kind of the guardians of the galaxy of the Mar- or of the DC universe, just to, yeah. yeah. So there's implications there in terms of the the anti life equation and what these um what the true nature of these reverse DNA clones are and the ways in which um, you know, Darkseid is able to just take and corrupt these paragons of goodness to his will that are not really given any kind of explicit meaning in the text right. of Great Darkness, but have so much potential when layered over the existing continuity of Young Justice, right? Because it's like, are these, you know, what what can the anti-life equation do beyond just limit the will of individuals? What power can be, I mean, can you uh, create an entirely new version of a person that is... is uh, succumbs to your will, can you, like, with like, Granny, copy them, split, split in two, yep. and create an alternate, you know, uh, version? Yeah, so I have a lot of questions yeah, absolutely. about where we're going with these things. But here's here's a thing that I've been trying to contemplate. So, we have heard Greg and Brandon say that the fourth season's going to be focused on a smaller group. Mm-hmm. Here, I'm going back and forth in my head about this. Do you think the Legion is going to take the original team to the future in the 31st century in order to get their help to stop dark side from the great darkness saga oh rich do you think the original team from the first season basically can they bring them to the future to do to do this thing and focus on this quote-unquote smaller group now i don't think they would entirely leave everyone just in the 31st century but i mean and they could do it in three episodes and it would be epic and we would probably all really like it but i'm saying like why are the Legion here? Why are they coming back? So, and, and, and the Legions, when, when they show up now, when they're not doing their own thing in the future, but when they show up in our world, it is usually for two reasons. To grab someone yes. or to change something. Yes. And which, which are we up to? And is it both? Is it, you yeah. know? And well, which one of their standard nonsense, right? Right. Right. And because they, that's in Just League Unlimited, that's what they did. They went back in time. They ended up taking Supergirl, uh, John Stewart. And, and Green Arrow, yeah. and then Supergirl ended up staying in the future for some really interesting and compelling reasons. Yes. Um, one of the reasons why I love that version of Kara uh, being who she is, right, um, that I don't see represented as well in other, in other things that makes her so different than Clark. Absolutely. And so, and so it's, it's that, again, standard tropes, this, this, uh, this inertia, mm-hmm. right, of story, like this kind of story has been told over and over again, um, kind of idea, this echo, this callback, mm-hmm. this, just like we got with Judas Contract. Mm-hmm. We got a version of Judas Contract, like the through they they deconstructed it yeah. to call all the way back to the beginning of this chat. 
They deconstructed the concept of Judas contract and said, what is the through line? What is the point? What is, what is the thing that is narratively important in this for character driven and the story that we're telling? Let's tell that story, right? And do that, that emphasis, right? And have that echo. It makes sense to me. They send back and we've got Saturn Girl, right? And and usually the group is Saturn Girl, Cosmic Boy, sometimes Brain Act 5 because he has to deal with yeah. the, the time bubble that goes back. And He's got to do all the science. It's a whole thing, right? I'd love to jump in really briefly on, a, on another continuity point here and launch very briefly into the third reboot of the Legion, which comes after the Infinite Let's Crisis. Let's do it. The fans call it the three boot because it's the third time we're trying this again. And it's a very different take. It's a, it's a very different take on the Legion that harkens back to some of the earliest stuff from the superhero club era. Right. So this version of the 31st century is an extremely stagnant society. They really play into that. And underagers on all planets are monitored by this universal tracking system known as the public service, which I'm just going to re- read a quote here. It it's allows adults to steer away kids from rebellion and towards quiet lives of inaction. Yes. The free exchange of ideas has been supplanted with this notion that protocol and decorum are civilization's most sacred ideals. This sounds so... Uh- yeah, I think I have read some of these issues. So this sounds imagine, so familiar. You can imagine how the Legion feels about that. Yeah, <laughs> and, not and great. So yeah. the Legion in this context is an entire countercultural movement. And and there's a lot of really interesting detail there. I kind of like into. that idea. It's fascinating. Some people really didn't. Some people do. It's, it's, it's I like the concept. You, yeah. it's, like it's saying it's like, oh, this, this sounded good on paper. Did it yes. get pulled off is but the question. The ways in which it plays into Young Justice for me is the ways in which Young Justice has interacted with the living legacy of the DC Universe. Because this version of the Legion is one which shamelessly embraces the, the, the code names, the costumes, the outlandish Silver Age nonsense, and wears it like a badge of honor because of the ways that it allows them to stand out against the society that they've The bright colored in. costumes exactly. and the, the, uh, the alliterative names and the... That and wow. the fact that they read comic books. These inspirations come from actual physical comic books, <laughs> which we don't have time to dive into all of the implications of this, but ends up being because this is the Legion of Earth Prime the universe which is designated as our universe. The right. universe, the universe that, that, the that real... All, no superheroes exist on the Earth and it's all comics. Right. So these are the comic books we are reading that they are then reading later, thinking that these people were real, even though they weren't. Like they were historical documents. Yes. And are, they're inspired by that. And so that, to me, is so fascinating, looking at the way that we explore legacy in Young Justice and the way that it is a baton that is handed from generation to generation. And what do you have when there's a generation that is ready to take up that baton, but there's no one ready to pass it? Well, you go back and find who was ready to pass it a thousand years ago, right? If there was no heroes to inspire directly this group, they're going to go back and they're looking for Nightwing and all these people that, you know, may have been the idea behind their movement, but they have no idea what they were really like. They have no idea of the actual events that inspired, right. you know. So that is one thing that I think could be relevant. Right. And and also, like I said, the tie-in, like, we're, okay, Superboy is now a public entity and they know historically they might be able to dig up something about when he, when and where he was. Yeah. But also, this whole season is now taking Earth and doing what Vandal was doing in the second season, which is, this is the era, the, these few years, which the Legion means nothing, right? Right. <laughs> right, these couple of years is, this is the time in which Earth became understood and, and known and uh, to, the, to the greater galaxy. It is putting us on the path towards right. the Legion's future. And I know that's something you and I talked a lot about way before we even had any conception that the Legion would enter into this world. Yes. Of being like, I love at being a very obscure DC fan, knowing that we're headed in this direction, that this we get to see the building blocks, and it's like, well, now we're actually seeing what we're building to, in addition. That's something that I, I know that you and I have differing opinions on this show, and we've talked about it a little bit, but the CW Supergirl, yes. that I, I fully accept all criticisms of the earlier seasons of this show, but something that they've really done to pick themselves up and become more socially relevant recently is to explore, you know, not just alien refugees in the context of modern politics, which is interesting and important, yeah. but also alien refugees in terms of what that does to change the culture of the planet Earth. And we have Brainiac 5 is actually living in the 21st century now in the fourth season of Supergirl. And, and you know, there it's we're, we're seeing the ways in which the, the, the unfolding world of Supergirl's day-to-day life is becoming the future that Brainiac 5 lives in and where, where, where 
humans yeah. and aliens exist in, in peace on Earth and all of that sort of stuff, and, and the conflicts that have to be broached before that. That and see, and you brought that stuff up. That sounds really fascinating to me. And of course, when I heard that they had Legionnaires showing up in like Monel, and I watched some episodes of Monel, and I'm like, where did Monel? When did Monel become like a player? This is very strange to me. So some of these takes were not helpful for me. And if you're um, a, if you're a hardcore Legion fan, you'll you will not be thrilled. Like, right? They take a lot of liberties. I'm yeah, just gonna yeah, put that out yeah. There now, and but. so the Supergirl show inspires a lot of people, and I'm super excited about that. No pun intended. I love that. Um, I think the uh, I think my challenge here that that he and, that that Jamie and I had talked about and the differences, and I'm glad that you're sharing these things in the direction they're going because it sounds really interesting yeah. to me, and yeah. I, I think I'm going to check that out. The Kara that I was referring to in the Justice League Unlimited is so different than Clark. He is, she is so different in this idea that she was older when her planet died. It's like she she grew up with massively advanced technology that she understood and knew because she's brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. And this technology, and she's living now basically on this backwards planet that she doesn't really understand the cultures of, and she doesn't understand what's happening. And Clark didn't know any of that and grew up on Earth and is trying to help her fit in, but she feels like an outsider and out of place. And that way you get Clark and Kara being not the same person, right? And so I love that. And the idea in this Justice League or this Legion episode of Justice League Unlimited, when they go to the future, Kara's like, Kara bonds with this Brainiac. Like home. Right. She bonds with Brainiac because they understand, they have a thing for technology and, and she feels more at home and comfortable there yeah. and really enjoying it there and feeling safe. And the funniest line, one of the funniest lines, I think, in all of Justice League Unlimited, honestly, aside from the questions, brilliant stuff, is when uh, Arrow, uh, Green Arrow and Green Lantern go back in time and Kara gives them uh, gives them a, a holographic cube to, to give a message to Clark and says that she's found a boy there. This boy Kara likes so much. Does he have a name? Does he have a name? Yeah. <laughs> that's the last and line. And they yes. just... And they just look at each other and that's it, right? Uh-huh. The old Brainiac 5. Yeah. So so I love I loved that version of Kara making her not just some cookie cutter of, of Clark. And the first... I, I, I love the actress who plays Supergirl. She's incredibly talented. I do like the character that she's playing. I can't... I can't... Couldn't narratively reconcile this idea yeah. that she had this kind of... Um, what's the uh, lowest... It's like Hayseed or Haystack or whatever she calls Clark, mm-hmm, you know, like mm-hmm. this kind of small town. Sure, growing, sure. It, 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 it didn't gel with me. And and there are things in season two that are really interesting and there are things in season three that are really interesting. Sure. I'm fascinated to see what you're talking about yeah. in this season. So. I, I will say before we dive back into Legion that, that that is something that gets deconstructed. And I will say that I felt the same at the beginning, that a big part of my Kara, especially because I started reading her when she was rebooted post-crisis, and yes. so it's a shorter timeline of her existence, and we get to see her come to Earth. Yeah. Um, a big part of that for, of her existence for me was that she was almost an adult when she came to Earth, right. and that yeah. she was planning to raise Clark. And in this, in the show, they go with something more nuanced and in-between of, of the, uh, the child that is not quite an adult, but is not a baby. So right. like she had her adolescence that she mostly kind of remembers but a lot of it is is probably fake memories or or you know like remembered from pictures and things like that yeah. on another planet and then most of her formative puberty teenage Years. stuff was on earth that's and interesting that gets unpacked where it's like how much of that hayseed thing was her trying so desperately to fit in the, with the family that so lovingly adopted her and then what parts of it are like this is never going to change because I'm an alien from another planet. I love it when I'm sitting here and I have people, someone share with me something about what they love about a thing and I get it. I totally get it. I right. see that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And so let's let's dive back into this question that I had. Oh, which thing? What do you think is going to happen? Are they going to take him to the future? Are they going to come to the past? How are they tying this in? Mm-hmm. Particularly when you're talking about the Great Darkness Saga. Yeah. I have one really quick thing that yeah. is a potential answer for that that I actually don't think will happen because I think they're leaving him dead. But for Wally fans, I have to bring this up. I have to bring this up as a possibility. The fourth reboot of the Legion is what is called the Retro Boot. That is the area. Or that is the era that is my. I feel like the one that I'm the most attached to, uh-huh. and it is basically after Infinite Crisis, which is the sequel to Crisis on Infinite Earths, where they brought yes. back the multiverse and they're saying we're making it right. simpler, F- but it Earths. still it exists. Right. Yeah. They also brought back the notion that even though he wasn't Superboy at the time, he wasn't using that name. He had the costume, and Young Clark was a member of the Legion. And the gold or the the Silver Age and the Bronze Age uh, stuff from the seventies and all that it happened. 
Wildfire, Dawnstar, all of those people, they're his friends, they're real. He hasn't seen them since the first crisis and doesn't know why, but they're there. They reemerge for the first time in, an, in a storyline called the Lightning Saga. Yes. Where they're oh, showing yes. up in the present and uh-huh. they don't have memories. Yes. And Starboy. If, if oh, you yeah. Watched, mm-hmm. uh, Justice League versus Fatal Five, you know a little bit of this. Starboy has actually been living in the present and is a member of the JSA, calling himself Starman. Um, but he is suffering from schizophrenia because he doesn't have the um, 31st century medication that he's used to treat it his entire life. Right. So he's a little adult, has a, has a hard time keeping straight their mission, and they've chosen him to be the one person that is supposed to be cognizant of what is going on and can wake up the others. So he goes around, there's a, a group of other Legionnaires, I believe it's Karate Kid, Timberwolf, Sensor Girl, Triplicate Girl, Dream Girl, and like a couple others, and they're Wildfire, I mean, and, and Dawnstar, I think. And they are in the present, don't remember who they yes. were, and Tom Kalor, Starman, wakes them up by using the phrase lightning lad in interlac. Okay. And they're here with a bunch of lightning rods, which there was a story right. in the uh, Silver Age where lightning lad was killed. He was kept, his body was kept in stasis through electrical, some sort of nonsense. Cause it was <laughs> right. like, he's lightning lad. Let's put consistently generating lightning bolts over his grave, you know, just as a nice aesthetic choice. Um, and then it turns out that there's this super science thing where if a, Five people stand with lightning rods at different points on the planet. One of them will get struck with lightning and their energy will be transferred into the other person and they'll bring them back to life. Right. They use that to bring lightning lad back to life and they're here in the present to do it again. And it quickly becomes clear based on the locations that they're at. The lab at Central City Police where the lightning first struck. The mansion where Flash first attempted to contact Batman during the Crisis on Infinite Earths when he was existing beyond time. Yes. All of these places, they're like, oh, they're here for a flash. And they uh, do do the whole lightning thing. None of them have to die because Karate Kid dodges. <laughs> I don't know how that works because I thought it has something to do with the transfer <laughs> of the lightning, but whatever. Okay. And Wally West, who hasn't been seen since the Infinite Crisis and his entire family are restored to the timeline. I don't know what is going to happen with that, but the Legion loves their lightning rods, and they love bringing people back. Now, it turns out, actually, this was, Wally was just a side effect and an accident, and they were actually there to get Bart, who was also dead at the time, to try and take down Superboy Prime in the future, because he was- We're not getting into Superboy Punch in the Universe Prime. We we, we can't do it. (laughs) But there is an intimate connection that has been formed in recent years between Speed Force and the Speedsters and the Legion due to their overlapping time travel stuff and all yep. that kind of thing. I know, or I should say, I've gotten the impression that Greg really doesn't like the idea of the Speed Force. He's kind of, yeah, we get differing opinions. Yeah. Like, he has said that he didn't like it, and then he's he's kind of said that's not really what I said, but that yeah. kind of stuff. But I, I think, yeah, I we haven't seen any evidence of the Speed Force. No one's talked about the Speed no. Force yet. And it's one of those things, and he hasn't even alluded to the Speed Force, and it's one of those things now, after three seasons, I'm looking at it and going, like, he hasn't even planted the seeds yet. Like, if he dropped a Speed Force thing going on right now in season four, unless he starts planting the seeds right at the beginning of the season, I, I, I would want to go back to season one and say, like, oh, look, in this episode, I never even noticed. I'm not, so I'm, I'm still leaning toward we're not going to go with the Speed Force. That doesn't mean time travel and that kind of stuff is not a thing. Yeah. I would definitely agree, and I also think it's it's a creative choice based on, not to project intention onto them, but just kind of to interpret what I have heard, just that it, it feels important to leave a character dead. And I don't think it's a random choice, I don't think it's like, we're just leaving someone dead, because to show that death isn't a, resol- a revolving door, I think it's it's very intentional to have it be a main character, a beloved character, a Flash, who are known for coming back to life. And frankly, the Flash for a lot of people, I was convinced at the end of season two that that was not the last we were going to see because I was like, why would you do Wally and not let him become his version of the Flash? Because he was the Flash for so many of us. Yeah, yeah. Why would you end him at Kid Flash? But this is a different version. And I think that is maybe intentional trying to say like, we're doing something else here and Wally's not going to be the Flash of this universe. Said it in the scream something. I'm sure we're going to say it in the future when Emily and I record the individual episode. Mm-hmm. But the this episode with uh, Zatanna and and Miss Martian trying to help Artemis process through her things. At first, it was like, "Yep, 
he's dead. This is confirmation he's dead. I love it. This is great. Like, I love that he's going to be this, the hero who died, blah, blah, blah. And at the end, I was like, oh, no, he's 100% not dead. I am absolutely convinced now that he's not dead. I'm absolutely convinced he'll come back. I agree with you. Wally was the Flash that was not nearly as fast and, and all that kind of stuff. And then he had lots of changes happen in the comics. And then he comes back and he's even more tuned in, in the comics and the Speed Force right. and becomes even more powerful than Barry in many ways. I want to, we all want to see that Wally, but the fact they gave us a whole season with seeing the actual grieving and the, and how it affected everyone. I'm good with him coming back now because we've gotten the chance to see that deep effect. And I will say I'm someone who has consistently had issues with the revolving door of death in comics, particularly the way that it's been used lately, because as someone that, felt the impact of those deaths, it has always felt like cheating. You know, and it's, I understand the desire to return to form with some properties, but the way that it is used across the board now, like just, oh, I want this person, I'm just going to pluck them up from wherever they are, has always bothered me. And, yeah. and, and that's because you don't get those experiences of feeling that loss anymore the way that you do in season justice, or Young Justice Season 3. Yeah. Like uh, Donna Troy. I never read a lot of Donna Troy. I, I, I read, went back and read New, Titan, New Teen Titans later as, as more of a young adult and a teenager. But growing up, I mostly knew her as the mentor and the big sister of Cassie, who was my Wonder Girl. Right. Who, or the best friend and, of Dick Grayson and, and all of these things where she, it was like her murder left a void in these people's lives that made the tapestry of the narrative richer yeah and not to say that those stories don't have that same value but when you keep bringing people back like that i agree yeah it's it's right and that's it that's the thing that we get in young justice that we don't get in the comics we've talked about the timeline the consistency the growth the change we get to see this thing that's happened in its own self-contained universe and we get to explore this thing this grieving right for a character and we get to see this effect that it has on people which i think is really important and in this thing that I, I just didn't expect to happen when I first started Young Justice in the first season, literally the entire DC universe being put into the show, seen from the vision of, of the teenagers. And, yeah. and again, knowing now, knowing for sure now that the Legion is going to show up, although I talked about it and I just thought I'm never going to get a version of the Young Justice version of the Legion, it all just makes too much sense. Makes too much sense. I will say that um, in that vein, one of the things outside of the Legion, because obviously I'm just so deeply excited for everything that is going to come with the Legion, but one of the things that I'm excited that I hope we get a little bit of from them is hints of what can come for our time. I, I want to, because they're not stagnantly being inspired by them in their teenage years. They have their entire history to look back on, right? And right. it's like, I don't want to get all of it. I don't even want to get close to all of it, but just like the implication that it's like, we've gotten the perspective of the DC universe from the kids looking on, right? Right. We've, we've seen them looking at the history and then everything that comes ahead is their oyster. They're like, we're going to see how it becomes their DC universe. And that's the past for the Legion. So right. we're going to get to see more of what that tapestry looks like that leads us to the Legion's future and leads us to, you know, how to, does the Justice League continue to expand to hundreds of members and do they expand across the galaxy? I don't know. Is that how the Legion gets the idea to do that? I don't know. What happened to them? Why aren't they around anymore? What's any of that? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh-huh. uh-huh. I, I love every piece of it and I can't wait. I can't wait too. Oh gosh. Thank you so much, Jamie. Like Thank we you. even just scratched the surface on the Legion. Uh, I suspect this will be a, a, a long couple of episodes, yes. uh, but I hope that people get an idea of why we're so excited about what's coming up in season four, what potentially could be coming in season four and know a little bit more about some stuff. Please check out uh, DC universe or comiXology or your friendly local comic store and pick up some, some stuff with the Legion and check out some of these runs. Where can people find you out here on Earth Prime if they want to ask you questions about maybe where they should start or check out comics or anything else? Sure. So I'm relatively new-ish to understanding Twitter. I've had it since like 2015 or so, but I'm uh, at, I think it's just at Jamie underscore Catania. Okay. Uh, my name. And then uh, Instagram, I'm at FJCat too. You can message me on there too. I think my settings are private, but you can shoot me a message or something. And yeah. Perfect. That sounds great. Um, and thanks to everyone else for spending some time with us. 
If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If that isn't enough, you can email us directly at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Thank you.